Okay. Testing, testing. We are quick. Yep, yeah, we're going now. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another live stream from Deep Astronomy. My name is Tony Darnell. I'm driving this bus, this disaster, this crash ready to happen. <laughs> Today, we're going to be talking about the Vera Rubin telescope. I mean, what's so great about it? Why is everybody so excited? And I have to tell you, there's a little, this is, this stream is the result of a little bit of a misunderstanding. Last Tuesday, I was streaming, had Peter on the Discord server, and we were talking and chatting, and he said, hey, there's a chat uh, uh, in here about doing uh, a, a video on some instrumentation, and we misunderstood that the, misunder the, that the guy was asking for instrumentation, and we somehow we got to Vera Rubin, and I said, hey, I know, let's do a stream on the Vera Rubin uh, telescope. What he really wanted was some was a video on the JWST instrumentation, which I promised in the last countdown to JWST episode. So that's coming. That's still going to happen. But I still want to do this stream anyway. <laughs> so we're going to talk about it because this is an amazing observatory that's getting ready to go online here in a couple of years. I think it'll probably be online by 2023, I think. Uh, getting first light sometime next year. So they're getting everything put together. But really, this is an amazing setup. And you're going to learn about all of that here today. So welcome, everybody. I want to let you know that I am streaming on all the platforms. Uh, Twitch, Twitter, Facebook, YouTube. So let's give some valuable personal data away, shall we? Let's go ahead and get started. I want to uh, welcome everybody here. I'm going to get my chat. I'm looking at the chats of everything that's coming up. Oh, Jim Jimmy D's here from Australia. Welcome. Good morning to you. Good morning. What do you guys say in the morning? Oh, uh, so anyway, I could look at all of that. Rick Paul. Oh, hey Raj. <laughs> I click the the chat's going too fast for me to click. Rick Paul. Hey, what happened to the Space Junk Podcast? That is a great question, young man. And let me tell you what's going on with it. I just got through talking with the OPT guys and Dustin et al. And so, as you know, we've been on a hi hiatus, which since July. <laughs> so it's a hell of a hiatus. Anyway, we're starting back up next week. Uh, Wednesday, we record our first episode in a while. And I will be posting, or we will be posting it on Friday. So we tool things a little bit. Going to have slightly different... Uh, not much of a different, but somewhat of a different topic list. And uh, we're going to be talking a lot more about gear uh, in the in the, in the the podcast, along with some science, whenever I can fit it in. Uh, but Dustin and I will be back next week. So next Thursday, please look for it. I'll post it on Anchor.fm, but it's going to go out to Spotify and all those other places. So thanks for asking about that, Rick. It's coming back. It's coming back. Uh, and yes, and Galaxia also says coming back in October, but specifically... <laughs> the very last week in October, which is next week. So there you go. Dr. Learn Lungworm is here. Now, the way you scare the way you spell that scares me for some reason. Whenever I see that, I feel lurky. I don't know what that means. Neil, it's good to see you too. Broken Symmetry is here. Uh Jimmy D is up at 6 a.m. in the Australian morning. You guys are getting ready for summer. Is it hot there yet? It's still hot here in Florida, but it always will be. Uh, <laughs> we might get a, a, maybe six weeks of some kind of nippiness where it might get down to about, I don't know, eight or nine Celsius. Uh, you guys might be like, what? That's not even cold, but yeah, I mean, that's, that's sort of how Florida is. Uh, yeah, we, well, you know, it's just how to redo, you know, a lot of stuff happened. OPT has been, uh, been, you know how they are. They always go balls to the wall with everything they do so they got about a million things in the air and we needed to do i guess a break from that uh, podcast for a bit and it's come but at least it's coming back so that's good um disillusion from twitch it's good to see you also and um and jimmy d is like i've been missing the podcast as well uh so this is a nice time of year it's not too hot um okay so <laughs> uncle bill's good to see you too yes yeah, space junction reason i started doing podcasts at all well, thank you. I'm glad that you're watching them. Um, uh, so uh, anyway, there's, there is that. 
let's so the format of this thing for those of you who are joining and going what in the hell's going on by the way let me just say i appreciate you twitter i look at all the stats on all the people watching all the different platforms twitter kicks everybody's butt in terms of viewership so welcome to you guys on twitter you know what's weird about that though is your of all the platforms i'm streaming to yours is the only one or twitter is the only one i can't see the chat in real time probably gonna have to start some kind of dumbass hashtag i guess to to give twitter some some personal data on and then maybe i'll be able to just do a search on that hashtag but i won't be able to do this kind of thing where i could do you know like with crypto here saying hi i can't do that but um but i can do um uh, I can at least read the, the hashtags when it comes down. So welcome Twitter, man. I'm really pleased that that's working. Periscope went to crap. And they don't use that anymore. So uh, and with my little meager following on Twitter, it's pretty good return on investment, I must say. Okay, I like to start. So this is the format. I come up with a topic. I talk about it for 20, maybe 30 minutes at the most. And then I open up the chat. If you want to talk on my pod, on this little stream with your own actual voice to be heard by actual ears and not be captured by the uh by the plat but social media platforms we're streaming on get on discord get on the discord server because at least for now right now discord hasn't turned into a data capture place where they just all they want is your personal data discord is 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 uh uh pretty much open as far as i know they're not spying on us but who knows it might be and if you get on the live stream voice channel and uncle bill's here so he might be able to help anybody who's having trouble then get on there. If you've got a mic, I'll be able to hear you. As soon as I put my earphones on, I can click a button here on my little mixer, and boom, you're in the stream. You're in the pod. You're in this. You're in, and we're talking as if just your voice. Not we don't have to do video. Uh, so if that's that's a really cool way to interact. So do that, Finland. No way, no way. Good evening, man. It's good to see you. Thank you for joining from Twitch. One of these days, man, I'm going up there. I'm going not just to, I'm seeing all the countries up there. I love, I, I've been, I've been dying to see the, the wildlife and the nature that's up in that area of the world. So welcome. It means a lot to me that you're here. Uh, Galaxy is also in that part of the world, not in the same country, but um, that's really, I really am very glad to have you. But before I start on Vera Rubin, I know you're like, oh my God, when is he ever going to shut up and start talking about Vera Rubin? Well, I will in just a minute. But first, I have some news. News, everyone. Space news, everyone. With the Webb Telescope, the Webb Space Telescope, which is still going to be called Webb to Space Telescope, um, has been unboxed. This is just this is from Space Flight Now. This is from a couple days ago. They've taken it out of its container, and it's hanging up right now. They've taken it out in the payload processing facility. There it is in Koru, French Guyana, already getting ready uh, in another in a clean room they have there, ready to be put on the rocket. The status is that, let me scroll down just a little bit. Uh, since arriving last week in French Guyana, Webb was trucked to the S5C payload processing facility and removed from its custom built transporter and ground teams are, st are started testing the observatory to ensure it's still in good health following the ocean journey from California. So this is from Greg Robinson, the Webb's program director. He says that it's out of the shipping container. It's gone vertical, and we've started our final major systems test today. It will last just over a week. We will do final closeouts. We'll move it, and we'll move over and get it fueled in a few weeks, and then made it to the rocket and encapsulate it to the, in the fairing and get it off the ground on December 18th. You know whose job I would not want to have? Gregory Robinson's. <laughs> On the one hand, this has got to be the most exciting time in his life, right? But it's either all or nothing with him. This is either going to make him world famous or it's going to uh, kill his career. <laughs> He's the program director for Webb at NASA. He's in charge of this thing. And uh, wow, I got to hand it to him. I don't know how... He, I don't know how he gets through the day, to be honest with you, but that would be one scary, scary job. So that happened today. I wanted to let you guys know that's from Space Flight Now. This was posted, um, actually it was posted today. So there's the date up there. Uh, so it was posted today. The other thing I want to show you is check this out. 
I just saw this today. This is a motorcycle that NASA is building to go on the moon with. Now, we re- for those of you as old as me, you remember that this is a, um, remember the car, the lunar lander they drove around in was an electric vehicle. It was really cool, but we didn't have a motorcycle. Now, NASA, I think, is getting just a little bit cocky here. We're flying helicopters on Mars. We can't just be driving four-wheel vehicles anymore. No, we got to have a motorcycle. Check out these pics. <laughs> oh, that's pretty small. Well, you get the idea. It's, it's a pretty, pretty small pic here. But here it is. Here's somebody actually trying to ride this thing. They're calling it the Tardigrade One. Just go back and forth and absorb this. Uh, somehow, you, this face suit cracks me up, though. It looks like he's wearing a jacket <laughs> instead of a space suit. And I don't know, man, if the space suits that NASA eventually ends up with are going to be that uh, slim. Look at this. He's got a little zipper here uh, that's not been zipped. Uh, so I, I, I don't know. I don't know, man. Make, make of this what you will. Um, <laughs> But I saw that. I had, to go. I had to show it to you. I don't know what is uh, what 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 that even is going to happen. I mean, NASA it, NASA's having a hard time even making spacesuits. So I don't know. Balance would be an issue, I would think, even in the gravity, even in the the low gravity of the moon. So um, so let's see. Justin wants to know when first light is for uh, Webb. Uh, <laughs> no, first light. So they're going to launch it in December. It's going to be deployed and, and commissioned over about six weeks after launch. And I imagine first light is going to be early, early in uh, next year. Uh, so we'll be seeing something come of it within January or February at the latest, I would think, unless something really went wrong. So, so, um, Yeah. All right. So let's get started. I know I've been making you wait. Let's go ahead. Let me pull up my my slides. I made a slide thing. So here we go. What's so great about the Vera Rubin telescope? I don't know. You tell me. Okay. let's start with some summary facts. It was used to be called the LSST, the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope, but now they're still using LSST because you know they spend a lot of money on branding and stuff. It's the same reason why they're probably not going to ever rechange the name of James Webb Space Telescope. Um, it still uses the LSST acronym, acronym, but now they're calling it the Legacy Survey of Space and Time. And it will deliver 500. These numbers, folks, are going to blow you away. Get ready to hear PETA, Giga, Terra all over the place. 500 petabytes of images and data products will be the final product after uh, 10 years of surveying. It's going to be looking at the entire sky every three nights. It's going to have an 8.4 meter telescope. It's really weird. I'm going to show you that in just a minute. But it is a special design that gives you a very, very wide field of view, like F1.2, I think. Really wide field. I'll show you more pictures of that in just a second. It's going to have a 3 billion with a B megapixel camera and it will be every single night that it observes will be producing 20 terabytes of data and it will be processed it's located in cerro pachon in chile which is a the one of the premier places to put telescopes these days eso is out there um ctio is out there a lot of a lot of uh, big major worldwide observatories are in that area of the world because it is high in the sky because of the mountain range, it's also dry in the sky because there's no very little water vapor making it very good for infrared observing. And it's also clear many, many, many nights. Okay, I showed you this before. In units of tennis courts, here are all the various planned and existing um mirrors and telescopes that exist both ground and space-based here is the one we're interested in right here 8.4 meters it's got this weird donut shape because here in this graphic they are planning they're trying to show everybody uh the uh collecting area the light collecting area of all the 
major objectives that are being that are in the world or are going to be built. And this is the major collecting area, this donut sort of torus shape uh, that will be collecting light from the sky from Vera Rubin. And as you can see, it's about a fourth of a tennis court. Here's an example. Here's a uh, a nice picture of the optical train of the, the mirror itself. It's uh, got three mirrors, three uh, lenses, um, and it's got adaptive optics all up here in this in this uh, um, secondary uh, region here, what we normally would be the secondary region. So light bounces off that torus we just saw in the previous diagram. You can see here between here and here. That's the main collecting area. The light goes up and it bounces off of this mirror here, which is a spherical convex mirror that bounces it back down into a middle di uh, diameter uh, concave mirror. So this, this piece of glass has one and two different figures in it. It goes up into a lens system up in here. So uh, this is a very unique design. It's designed to make this large light collecting ability and a large field of view. That's very difficult uh, to do at the same time. By by contrast, Hubble's, the Hubble Space Telescope is like an F, oh, what was it? We, we said that before. It was like F20 or something like that, right? 20 times the focal length of what we have here. Very narrow field of view, but it had a pretty big mirror, right? 2.4 meters. This is eight meters in diameter and has... The, uh, a very fast F sub two, uh, sub F two uh, focal length. So this is designed to get a big area of the sky with the shortest exposure time as you can get. Here's another uh, diagram of the point spread function, things like that on this thing. Uh, you can see that they have the focal lengths here, F1 mirror up here, and an F1.18 mirror here, and an F.8 mirror in here. So there's three mirrors, mirror one, mirror two, and mirror three, and then there's three lenses that go up into that thing I was showing you in the previous uh, diagram. Um, I've never seen one like this. I've never seen a telescope like this anywhere. Uh, here are the point spread functions very, very, uh, for, for wavelength, uh, as well as different parts of the uh, um, collecting area of the sky, or collecting area of the, of the focal plane, or the uh, optical elements. Look at this field of view. For scale, there's the full moon. <laughs> this is how much of the sky this telescope is going to be able to see in one exposure. Each one of those little squares is one of the sub-assemblies uh, of the camera. It's a hundred, it's a one point, each one of those squares is a 1.4 megapixel camera, or I'm sorry, 144 megapixel camera. That is added up all this area of the sky here to see. This is one area of the sky, one exposure. So it's going to see almost 10 square degrees and 40, which is 40 times the area of a full moon. That's its field of view. F sub two. I don't, I don't know how to say exactly what the focal length is because there's three different ones in there. So here's some, here's the building. This is pretty cool. Okay, it's going to be sitting on magnet, magnet motors, which will make it very smooth. They won't have bearings to sit on. It'll rotate. It's alt azimuth, as far as I can tell. Um, it'll be very quiet. The whole thing is going to be uh, designed to be run by without people. So people aren't going to be involved very much in the operation and moving of this thing. It's all going to be computers. It's got light battles, wind protection, thermal controls, all the stuff to keep the dome stuff down, uh, keep the seeing effects for domes. Gone are the days, folks, where we see these lone hemispherical capped structures in mountains. Turns out that's not a very good design for an observatory. And we certainly won't see them built out of things like brick or stone because that stuff just sits there and radiates heat all night long. So these are all, all observatories now are built with baffles and oh, in fact it'd be great if you didn't have to have a building at all but there are times when you need to close it up and protect the telescope especially during the daytime from a lot of heat and, and sun uh sun exposure so because these are way up in the in the atmosphere 
and can really be damaged by a lot of UV light. So this is a typical design of many observatories now, uh, lots of ventilation. Uh, the whole building rotates. This thing, this little square thing right up here, this whole thing will rotate. Uh, it's got a 350-ton telescope inside with a 16-meter pier, sitting on a 16-meter pier right down here. Uh, the camera clean room, where they want to work on the cameras and the optics are all down here. The control room, which is, I guess, where you sit when you're taking observations, is down here at the bottom. Now, this is built on a, this is built on a mountainside. In fact, let me show you something. Uh, let's see. Here is a live camera. Uh, you can go to lsst.org and see this, but here's what's going on right now. Uh, you can see the building shape and where it's sitting. Let me, uh, let me embiggen this a bit. Um, so you can see now the sun's right in the frame here, but this is a live or recently or very recent picture. You can see it kind of follows the contour of the ground here. Um, they have different cameras. Let's see what's on camera one. Yeah. Okay. Here's, here's the part where the clean room is, uh, the clean room, um, and the, uh, control room are down here in this part. So you can see there's a, a natural terrain there that this building is following. Let's go to camera three. Let's see what's in there. Oh, there's inside. Okay. So there's, they're still building this, <clears throat> still building this thing. So, um, so, uh, but that gives you an idea. I wanted to show you this part mostly so you could see that. No, not here. I wanted you to see this part mostly so you could see that there's a road leading up, natural terrain that it has to deal with. And that, that affects this quite a bit. So, um, <clears throat> so that's, uh, that's why this is shaped the way it is down here. This camera, <laughs> this camera blows me away, man. Look at the... So there's a person, or at least a, a, a replica of a person right there, a replicant. That's the size of the camera, folks. This is person-sized, or actually the size of an SUV. It's 1.6 meters by 3 meters in dimension. That is the camera, nothing else. It's a car, this camera. There's the lenses that we saw in the uh, in the other schematic I showed you before. There's a cryoscat right behind here that keep things cold, and a utility trunk. I guess if you need to move in, uh, if you get sleepy, you can just have a place to lay down. I can't believe the size of this camera. That is the camera. It is uh, weighs 2,800 kilograms. It can see from 0.3. Uh, uh, nanometers to one or some sorry 0. 0.3 to one micron that's its wavelength range that's from the near uv to the near ir it's got 189 16 megapixel detectors that are arranged on 21 rafts which i'll show you in just a minute for a total of 3.2 gigapixels this will be the largest camera ever deployed gigapixels 3.2 of them, each one in 189 um, sections of 16 megapixels each. Let's take a bigger look at that. Oh, wait. Now, here's a couple of GIFs that show you the, this is the filter wheel and the shutter mechanism. Um, this is how they're going to change filters and also how they're going to open and close the, the shutter. So I'll show you that. Okay, let's talk about rafts and towers. Again, we're talking about the camera again. This is a little bit busy of a graph because there's a lot of information on it. But they, there are 21 different platforms they're calling a raft. And each raft is uh, all by itself is a standard camera. It's a standalone camera all by itself. It's down here in this thing right here, the base plate and all that. That's a raft. Okay. Uh, and each raft is, you know, as you said, th as I just said, three by three squares of sensors. And there are 189 CCDs all together. Um, and each CCD is 4K by 4K. It's going to have 16 of these rafts, 144 channels per raft, which means it's going to be able to read out data quickly. This is a lot of data to be taking at one time. So it's got to read it out quickly. And each raft is on a tower uh, 
in each each tower this is a tower right here it's got cooling planes on it thermal straps all this stuff to keep the the detectors operating well and each one of these the raft plus the tower is a camera all by itself and they put these up in an array of um 21 of these all arranged in that that thing i showed you with the moon so each one of these are 144 megapixels in size just each one for a total of <laughs> three gigabytes i mean that just blows me away okay so that's the camera that's the telescope but here is another big innovation something that people don't appreciate um when they're talking about you know taking or doing these surveys and that's data management what do you do with all this in all this data now lsst is built i've never seen one of these before but they're calling it a data mining sphere and this is how they've broken up the sky so you're gonna so they've broken it up into each one of these segments uh numbered segments that uh have a certain um uh right ascension or declination width to them and this is how you'll be able to find data once it's once it's there but this thing, the, the LSST, the Vera Rubin Telescope, is going to be taking 20 terabytes with a T data per night. 20 terabytes every single night that it operates. It's going to have a total of 60 petabytes by the time it's done after 10 years. It'll have 20 per, uh, petabytes of catalog database. This is things that it's found, galaxies, stars, you know, all the stuff that's uh, that it found when in, in the... Uh, Survey is going to go into a catalog, and it's going to have, that's going to be twenty petabytes in size. Um, and by the time that the whole ten years is done, we're looking at several hundred petabytes of data. And just, I don't know if you can appreciate this part. Maybe those of you in quantum computing might know, might might find this. I wish I wish Zorn was here because oh, he would know. He works in quantum compute computing. To Compute one or to process one night's worth of data is going to require 150 teraflops per second of, of computing power. It's among the most powerful computers we've ever built in terms of supercomputing ability. In fact, when I was when I met the people working, I shared an office with a guy who worked in LSST data management. I was working on the dark energy survey at the time. He was in LSST. And they, this, this was in the building of the National... Uh, Center for Supercomputing Applications in Illinois, NCSA, and they had the most powerful computers around at the time. Now, this computing power was uh, basically equal to the most powerful computer that existed in 2004. But by the time this thing comes online, this isn't going to be enough. It's going to need something even more powerful. So what I found on the website is this last bullet point here that says, by first light, it will use innovative advancing advances into info information technology. And they didn't say anything more about that. This sounds a lot to me like what they said about JWST. Well, there's stuff we're going to have to invent to make this work. So to get this data processed as fast as it needs to be processed, I think some, st some stuff still needs to be invented because they're going to have two different kinds of pipelines. This is how the data are going to come off of the computer or off of the, uh, the, the mountain. They're going to have two pipelines. One of them they're calling near real time, which means that it's going to look at the data very quickly as much as it can at the moment it's taken. And it's going to look at the quality of it and it's going to make sure the instruments are calibrated. But it, it's actually the, the big deal here is it's going to look for transient science. And that's anything like that ranges from a supernova to a, a micro lensing event that could be happening, a black hole passing in, uh, in front of us and a star uh, between us and a star. It could be a, an asteroid or a near earth object uh, moving across the field of view. And then they're going to send out alerts almost immediately once they find them. So that's their near real-time data pipeline. Then they're going to have the static pipeline. This is where they're going to gather all of this data up in their data processing or data management computing center, and they're going to add up. They're going to co-add the images. This is what, when you take a, an image of the same part of the sky, and, and, or uh, if you take an image of a certain part of the sky, and then you go back, a little bit later and take another image of that same part of the sky, you can add them up to get more signal 
uh, out of them. So things that would ordinarily not be seen in one exposure might be seen after you've added this up 10 different times. Remember, this, it's looking at the entire sky every three nights. So it's going to be seeing the, same, the entire sky over and over and over. But they have to register it and they have to co-add it. And that's going to happen in the static pipeline. They're, all, they're also going to be doing weak lensing processing. These are things where um, uh, you're looking for, for uh, galaxies moving in front of other galaxies. Uh, and they're going to use that stuff for dark energy and dark matter research, dark matter science. And then finally, they're going to they're gonna automate automatically go through every single star point of light on every single image and decide what it is. Is it a star? Is it a galaxy? Is it an asteroid? Is it a supernova? Is it a nebula? What is it? And it's going to put that in a catalog. And that'll be done offline. And then I know you've heard of this, but a lot of these surveys come up later and they, they have data, what's called data releases, right? The Sloan Digital Sky Survey has had many of these. They've had several data releases. The Dark Energy Survey has had several data releases. This is where they take their data, process it in the background, and then come out with object catalogs and new findings of um, of what the data uncovered. And that's going to happen uh, in the static pipeline. So it's two different ways it's going to uh, process data. In the end, when all is done, they're going to have a science archive. And it's going, <laughs> these numbers crack me up. It's going to have 400,000 16 megapixel images every single night for 10 years, which is just that data alone is going to be 60 petabytes. It'll have a source catalog. This is all the things it found, stars, galaxies, whatever, you know, everything, period. All It's called a source. Everything it found is going to be a, a database with 7 trillion rows in it. 7 trillion with the T rows. This is everything that it's found. It's going to have an object catalog. These are things like uh, differentiated, you know, objects like galaxies and and stars and and um, uh, microlensing events. All of these things, uh, and it's going to each with like two hundred plus attributes. It each like its width, its its length, its height, its its luminosity, its wavelength it was taken at. All of this stuff. Uh, it's going to have thirty seven billion rows of objects. That is going to be the thing that scientists pour over for decades. And it's going to have 6 million rows of moving objects. Anything that it found that moved is going to be in the moving objects database. And then, of course, it's going to have all the alerts that it's issued. Worldwide alerts are going to be issued within 60 seconds. That's in that near real-time pipeline I was telling you about. And then, of course, it's going to have all the calibration crap that goes with it. So that's going to be the gold mine at the end of the, at the, end of the mission. Um, that, that people will be going through for quite a while. I think that's my last slide. Yes, it is. So, oops. So there we go. So that's what's so great about the Vera Rubin telescope. <laughs> it's not like most telescopes that we've heard about it. It's not like what ESO runs. It's not like what the Keck telescopes or Subaru or any, those are all point and shoot. Astronomers apply for time. They say they have something they want to look at and that they want to study. And so they get some time on this telescope and um, then they go look at it, whatever it is. Ada Carina, M87, you know, whatever it happens to be. It's the same with Alma. It's the same with all the observatories around the world. You always want to pay attention to a survey telescope. If it's called a survey, that means there's nobody applying for time. That means it's going to be looking at a certain part of the sky, or in this case, the whole sky, every single time it observes. You don't get to apply for it, but you do get to use the data. In the case of the Dark Energy Survey, the two surveys that I know of that were the most successful was the uh, Sloan Digital Sky Survey. It was a telescope located in New Mexico at, point, at Apache Point Observatory. And they looked at some region of the sky, I forget the exact footprint, but they could only see so much from where they were in New Mexico. And um, they looked at it for several some odd years. They also had uh, the ability to measure redshifts, spectroscopic redshifts, not, not photometric redshifts. 
And that was a very successful uh, survey, ran for many years, had, I think, three or four data releases. And then the Dark Energy Survey, which looked at, I worked on that for a couple of years. That was, they looked at 5,000 square degrees of sky, where it could see from Sarah, uh, Sarah Polo, Tololo, uh, and for 525 nights. That was it. 5,000 square degrees, 525 nights, what do you got? That's a survey. That's how surveys work. This one is going to be the survey to kill all surveys. While I don't know, while it doesn't look like it has any spectroscopic capabilities, it is going to have a lot of photometric capabilities in the sense of getting redshifts of these things. By looking at distant objects in different wavelengths, different red, you know, red filter versus green filter versus blue filter, I'm really simplifying this. But a galaxy that's being redshifted away is going to have a certain uh, brightness in a red filter. It's going to be brighter in the infrared than it will be in, say, the red filter uh, or the green filter or the blue filter. And you take these luminosities that you've measured from all of these different wavelengths and you get something called a photometric redshift. It's not as accurate as a spectroscopic redshift because you're not looking at lines that have actually been redshifted in a spectrum. You're looking at the bright relative brightness in various wavelengths to get that, to get that same information. The error bars are bigger, but it's better than um, not having anything. So it is a cool way, we call photometric redshifts, and it is a cool way of getting the distances of, of different galaxies out there. And this is gonna be looking the entire sky every single three nights, every, every three nights it's gonna do this. So it's gonna, <laughs> So it's going to look at the whole sky. Then it's going to do it again three days later. Then it's going to do it again three days later. It's going to do it again three days later. And it's going to do all this stuff I just showed you, right? It's going to add all these images. It's going to send out alerts. It's going to look for all, it's going to look for whatever you can find out by looking at the entire sky. It's going to use the most powerful computers we have available to process this stuff, not only in near real time, but in the background once it gets this data off of the mountain and <laughs> and then it's going to you know produce i think some of the most amazing science we since hubble i you know that i'm a space telescope guy you guys you guys know how much i love space telescopes but this one has got my crank turning i i'm really excited about this one a lot as, it, i'm as excited about this as i as i would be if they would build elf the exolife finder that's how much I like this. Okay. So let me get to some of the, uh, oh, I went a little bit longer than I should have. It's because I'm so excited, man. Okay. I'm going to just scroll here through some of the chat. Uh, is anybody, let me get out of this and let me, let me go. Do, do, do. Nobody's in the, Oh, yeah, there are. There's plenty of people. Ooh, wow. Look at all you guys. Uh, even Uncle B's there. Uncle B's not going to say nothing. All right. So here we go. I'm going to just... Can you guys hear me okay? If you, Oh, you guys all have muted your mics. So if you want to say something, that's cool. I get that you muted your mics. You don't have to say anything. You can just listen. Um, feel free Feel free to just talk. Oh, Tony, you're going to do something? Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, you, I always appreciate your... Your... <laughs> your... <laughs> There you Podcast, go. Yeah, or, well, yeah, whatever these things are. <laughs> I know, I get it, right? It's pretty, pretty crazy. Um, yeah, so I'm just really excited about this. If you guys uh, uh, feel free to say anything you want in the in the chat, just unmute yourself, and then I'll and interrupt me while I'm talking. I'm going to go through the chat here. Um, uh, Galaxy is commenting. Hello, Galaxy. By the way, um, I'm so excited for this. It's time. It was it was time we observed the whole night sky repeatedly and thus transiently. That's right. You don't get motions of the night sky, especially on the time scale of the the, 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 the cadence that this one's going to be doing every three nights. So if there's a near-Earth object coming at us, this is going to find it. Um, if there's a, a, a comet coming way out in the distant uh, solar system, this is going to find it. So yeah, this is, uh, this is uh, really going to be amazing. <laughs> this is really going to be amazing. Uh, Eric W. We're going to need a bigger <laughs> hard drive. Yes, I get the I get the joke. Uh, Salt tube. Um, Oak Ridge National Lab Frontier will have 1.5 exaflops. 
uh, El Capitan, uh, which is the name of it, I guess, to enable greater than two exaflops of double precision processing power. Right. So this one, what are we talking about here? We were talking about needing, um, let's see, this is trillions of floating point operations. So this is 150 teraflops. Um, so this, what well, you're saying, exaflops. Is exa, exa is bigger than tera. I, I, after, after a certain point, it just becomes all meaningless anyway. I don't get to, I don't get any way to visualize that stuff. I don't know what they're going to do. Actually, they, they, they say kind of, I, I got all this information from their website. That's, you know, I just went to lsst.org. You guys can do the same thing. I uh, got all this information from it and I couldn't find anything about this, this problem, right? They're going to need to use innovative advances in information technology. Okay, so I, 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 I met the guys working on the, the data management pipeline. They're smart, and they, the code is, you know, written in way, you know, definitely meant to be optimized. It's obviously uh, automated as well. So I, I think they'll figure it out. Um, so, so let's see. Uh, let Let's see. V Charlie, please remember that this telescope is in the southern hemisphere and can't see all of the sky. It can see most of it. Maybe I should. Maybe I should clarify what it can see, which is damn near all of it um, from that location. So, uh, but you're right. It is in the Southern hemisphere, relatively in this pretty close to the equator, but not, not exactly. Um, Courtney, uh, or Courtly, sorry. Um, what's particularly concerning, especially for a survey program, is the tremendous increase of LEO traffic expected over the next decade, satellite flares, unpredictable collision products, et cetera. That is an excellent point. Let's talk about that a minute. So for those of you who don't know, maybe you do know because you love Elon Musk, but he's starting his Starlink enterprise, which is going to have up to 42,000 satellites in it, which will be a internet connectivity for everybody on the planet. On the one hand, I'm very excited about this because I want to use the service. On the other hand, Courtly is right that what, uh, what this will mean, especially for survey telescopes, and especially in the dawn to dusk time frame, near about 30 degrees above the horizon for for the time when the geometry of the uh of the satellites are going to affect the absorbed observations this is going to be a problem so you're right about that in the early morning and in the late afternoon the sun is below the horizon or or near the horizon and going and 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 shining up underneath what would be this constellation of satellites bringing their reflections down to earth such that it could be captured by these surveyed instruments. That's the danger. ESO did a big survey, did a, and, and later the AAS, the American Astronomical Society, did a survey on this and found that the people most impacted by this will be the surveys. So yes, that is a good point. Very good point. Um, Uh, Michael Lubick uh, on, this is YouTube. Imagine how many planets it will discover during and afterwards around another other stars. Um, yes, I, I don't see, I don't know what the photometry accuracy will be on this. And the photometry has to do with the ability to detect dips in brightness. I don't know to what degree this is going to be able to, to detect dips in brightness. But boy, could you get some transient work done uh, with this kind of time cadence over the course of... Uh, the mission. <laughs> uh, so yes, I imagine that that would be considered a transient event um, and would probably go out as um, in one of the data releases, probably not as an alert because it would take a lot of this data to really get a decent uh, light curve, I would imagine. But I don't know. But it, yeah, I think it would it would help. It's not one of its biggest strong suits, I think, because the photometry is going to be, I think, limited uh, by its exposure time. And I think by definition, these are going to, I think I heard somewhere and don't quote me on this because I don't know a hundred seconds. I don't, I don't know. Uh, I, I couldn't find that before I started streaming. Um, so, and Charlie's saying, well, the color of a galaxy also depends on stellar ages. Galaxy with the active star formation will be bluer. Yes. But if they know the galaxy and the type of it is, I don't know much about photometric redshifts other than what I've just told you but there is a model one runs <laughs> to get that redshift. And I think it takes those into account. 
So uh, this is from Twitch, uh, Asari Greenfire. I know very little about telescopes. Speaking of computing power needed, how powerful do you think they will need? I just, yeah, so we're looking in the teraflop range. There was, and the only thing I could really compare it to was the statement that they said in the website of that was equal, 150 teraflops per second was equal to the most powerful computer that existed in 2004. Presumably they're, they're better now. Uh, so we're almost uh, 20 years later. Um, I don't know um, if, if there are computers powerful enough to do with it. I'm sure, I'm sure there are, <laughs> uh, but I don't know what they are. Uh, this would be in the realm of supercomputing and I don't, I won't, I don't know much about it. Uh, <clears throat> so let's see. Um, Galaxia's comment. I'm, I'm scrolling backward, guys, so I'm sorry. It's about the space telescope, uh, Vera Rubin, and the enormous data it will have. Oh, are you telling somebody else what this is about? Oh, it means, oh, yeah, sorry. Thank you, by the way, Galaxia, for doing that. Seven trillion rows. I have worked in Excel files with 15,000 rows. I can't imagine seven trillion. Dude, you don't work with these files. They work with you. <laughs> these, the Dark Energy Survey used Oracle. Okay, that was the database they used and they were paying millions of dollars for these licenses because and they had even a we have there was even a person from oracle on staff uh to to optimize these databases all of it comes down to how you index the tables for any of you database um uh, admins out there hats off to you first of all i could never do that job that would be a job is so stressful if you're in charge of a database anywhere in any company in a new organization man the stress is high because that database goes down, everybody goes down. And so uh, we used, they used Oracle in the Dark Energy Survey, and it had, you know, millions and millions of rows, billions of objects. And it all came down to how you indexed each of those tables. And by the time, the schema, by the time I got done, I mean, I'd stopped trying to figure it out, but the schema was so complex. There were these tables that were indexing other tables. And the way Oracle, and I guess MySQL, maybe to a lesser extent, or pre or, or was it Postgres? Um, I don't even know if those are still around anymore. Um, the indexing is is the real time consuming part. They pre, it's a way of pre understanding the relationships between all things, so you're not doing a naked search every single time. You could bet Google does this with with uh, the internet. They have indexed tables that are already been you know uh optimized for different searches and uh they probably do all this in the background every single minute of every day uh just sort of automatically i i, re I remember i early in the days of the internet i heard that they used mysql but I, i'm sure they've got their own fuck you database now that they use i don't know what it is so yeah it all comes down to how you index these tables to how fast searches can go because if you're looking at something with i don't know uh petabytes of data in it hundreds of billions trillions of rows you sort of don't put all that in one table <laughs> and and try to and try to and say i want to see all the galaxies with a, a magnitude 20 uh with uh with the following characteristics <laughs> you know and then just you know you'd be waiting years for that result so so um it's that's probably more you want me to talk about but um but that's that was the trick was in how it was indexed adam it's good to see you big data enables big discoveries very good we should get t-shirts to say that um uh let's see wonder when they're going to do the next event horizon telescope pictures this is from dennis on twitch yeah i know i i uh, well i did it m87 did they ever release the one from Sagittarius A star? I think we would have known about that. Maybe I thought they were imaging Sagittarius A star, but maybe I don't know. Uh, so Mongo database or what are they using? I, yeah, that again. I don't know. Dark Energy Survey used Oracle. Um, I don't. I don't know what they're using. Uh, we could probably find it out on their website if we wanted to search it. Um, Let's see. Charlie is commenting. Well, also partners are usually allowed first access the data release later to the general community. That's right. So uh, what he's referring to there is sort of who gets access to the data when um, there are collaborators in every uh, big 
deal like this, the Dark Energy Survey had collaborators, uh, different universities and institutions you joined. And what made you a collaborator was you had to have some kind of vested interest in the collaboration. Uh, you put in money sometimes, people, resources, and you became part of the collaboration. And one of the the understanding was you were going to get access to this data after it left embargo, which is usually, I think, a year, but it, it depends on, on what it is. I don't know what it is for LSST. And uh, after that, it becomes available to the general public as a data release. And they usually put it out in some kind of um, in some kind of format that you can query. The Sloan Digital Sky Survey, the time I left Dark Energy Survey, the Sloan Digital Sky Survey were the rock stars in this. They had something called Cast Jobs, which if you went to, it was a web page. You got to log in. You had to get approved and stuff, and you got to log in. And they had a web interface that lets you search that database really fast. And when they do a new data release, you could, you know, that you could search by data release or you could search by all the data releases or whatever you wanted to do. They had the premier thing at the time. And I, I'm embarrassed to say I don't know where the Dark Energy Survey ended up um, because I left it. But the they were heading to something similar, I think, to cast jobs. Um and so um, Charlie's also commenting, these are all issues that had to be addressed with the Digi uh, Sloan Digital Sky Survey. Uh, they didn't know how to do it at first, but then the tech came along. It will for this also. Sounds like you know what you're talking about, Charlie. So yes, um, um, <laughs> it's just computing power. I guess once you've got the software as optimized as it can be, I don't know if they're using GPUs or any of that, but I would think that would help them. Uh, it, then it just becomes a matter of throwing hardware at it. Once your algorithms have been optimized, um, and then it becomes a matter of just making better, better access to better um, hardware. That's me being a kindergarten. That's the kindergartners look at this whole thing. Uh, sorry, green fire is coming. I remember that picture of the black hole and when it was found. That was so cool. I know, right? Everybody was like, oh, you know, this is just a yeah, an orange smudge, an old orange donut. But then they realize what it is. Most that's true of most astronomy pictures, by the way. Most astronomy pictures, the amazing ones, don't look like much. Okay, you got your horsehead nebula. You're from Hubble. Your your Ada Carina pictures from Hubble. All this stuff, beautiful, beautiful pictures. But the ones that change your life are the ones that don't look like much. The first Hubble Deep Field in 1995. Didn't look like it was a crappy picture, just a bunch of smudges on a black background. But 5,000 galaxies in that image, in a spot in the sky where nothing was thought to be. Once you got that context, it became the really amazing picture. And of course, that's how I made that video I made. And then, of course, they did it again uh, with, uh, with uh, it's all 11,000 galaxies. They've done deep fields now with uh, frontier fields at all. And they just keep going with this. And they still see the amazing thing, amazing things. Same with that M87 Event Horizon telescope picture. It's just a yellow smudge or an orange donutty smudge. But that's an actual picture of an actual black hole in the center of an actual galaxy. This isn't some theoretical animation. Everybody always, there's always YouTube trolls. Whenever you show any kind of video on, on YouTube and you've got this animation or an artist rendering, they go, oh yeah, another artist rendering. <laughs> And then they, they still scoff at something like this M87 picture and go, oh, it's out of focus. You know, just no pleasing some people. But the, the pictures that change your life are pictures like that. They don't look like much. They're just smudges. They're little irregular pale blue dot, right? Carl Sagan turned us on to that. You know, what did he call it? A, a pixel in a sunbeam, right? I mean, <laughs> those are the images that take your breath away. Those are the ones that give you context to the universe. And all of them are ugly. <laughs> so, all right. I'm going to scroll down because I've been going up quite a bit. You guys are really chatting today. Thank you. Um, let's see. Uh, let's see. Dan is commenting. Hope they have a better... By the way, welcome, Dan, from Canada. Hope they have a better than superior security system to prevent hackers that could hold the data for rents. Oh, man, don't even go there. Wouldn't that be Wouldn't that be something? Panther? Panther suddenly needs to go out. Peek a boy. You peek a boy. I'm streaming. I'm streaming. I can't take you out right now. Um, God, wouldn't that suck? 
somebody just take security is an issue, right? I mean, this, but this is petabytes of data. How, I don't think it's going to be in any one spot that, first of all, you have to understand what it is you're ransoming. And I think that a lot of hackers are smart. I'm not trying to say they're not, but they would have to understand the nature of what they're taking. And um, I don't know, but it is a danger. I don't know what precautions they're taking for this. I don't even know if there's data throughput. The Event Horizon Telescope had to take pet, uh, what they called exabyte drives. These were these actual hard drives, actually. And what am I saying, exabyte drives? They they took hard drives off of the computer and they carried them down the mountain to the place where they needed to process the data. So um, they didn't do any data transmission at all. That's pretty air-gapped, <laughs> I suppose is the term. Um, uh, they took the hard drives. I don't know what the pipeline infrastructure is like for Vera Rubin. Um, I want to reach out to them. Maybe somebody will come on and stream with me and answer these questions because that's a good, that's a good point. Um, John, welcome, man. It's good to see you from the UK. Now build something similar on the far side of the moon so the aliens who live there can see just how clever we are. Yes. <laughs> Archive. Oh, wait, hold on. What are you talking about? Data from Sloan made so many archive papers, papers they will scale up those interesting works and surveys. Can't wait. That's right. Um, Sloan kicked out. I mean, that was that's still, um, I think, one of the premier data, say, data sets. I don't, I think by definition, DES was smaller just because it, it only ran for a few, a uh, couple of years. But, um, but Sloan is still setting the standard, most of because of its spectroscopic data, right? That's the one. The red shifts are what mattered, and that we're and they built these three dimensional cosmic web uh, maps. I mean, most of us have seen them, and they they are that's pretty important. That's pretty amazing. Um, uh, Cryptolicious, you sound like you are a uh, database guy. I don't know what they could use if not MongoDB. I don't know what MongoDB is, so I can't comment. But it sounds like you're a DB guy. You're a database admin, aren't you? You're a DBA. Charlie, the primary and tertiary mirrors have support systems that can correct those mirrors by bending them. Uh, any idea how the corrections are determined and how frequently the corrections are applied? Well, according to what I read, <laughs> again, this is just from their website, they're going to be applying these corrections in the near real-time pipeline, okay, that I that I know of. They're going to have to, first of all, uh, to get the, the alerts out. But... Um, uh, I don't know the answer to the questions exactly. Um, certainly, they'll have these corrections applied, you know, when they do the data processing later. But I'm sorry, I don't know the answer. Um, Neil, do you know how many people will be looking into the data? Or will the computer have capability to alert when it finds something of concern? Dude, there's no way a person or a group of people or race of people... <laughs> are going to be able to go through this in any kind of way uh, that makes it uh, uh, practical. You're you're talking about probably machine learning kinds of things being run on these data, these algorithms, uh, or I'm sorry, on these, on these data. Um, I'm sure that's one of the info technology things that they are uh, going to be exploring, um, but there's not going to be people looking at this. There's no way. Petabytes of data and terabytes per night, right? What is it? 20 terabytes per night. Ain't no way. Ain't no way that the people are going to be looking at this. Um, there will probably be spot checks. Uh, the near time or the near real time data pipeline is probably going to be looking for quality assurance. There's going to be a QA check done throughout the night as it runs to make sure the data are being taken. I don't know what that involves, but they're going to have to look at the entire that somehow make sure that there's quality assurance being done on the data as it's being taken. Then alerts go out uh, within 60 seconds. So that's, that, you know, so there got to be some major processing happening, I think, on site. Um, again, on 20 terabytes of data, there's no way a person's going to deal with that. So it's all going to have to be some sort of machine learning, I imagine, algorithms designed to parallel process all of this stuff in uh, in some manner. And uh, I wouldn't be surprised. I think LSST is a is a corporation. And so I don't know if this stuff is owned by them or if it's going to be handled like a um, 
handled like a proprietary algorithm data set or whatever it is. But if because science is involved, they're going to definitely have to provide some mechanism for which other researchers can use this data and produce scientific results with. So I don't know about the ownership of the algorithms or pipelines or any of that, but there's a lot to be learned from this. And this is not the only survey coming down the pike. So uh, when the square kilometer array comes online, I think they're going to want, they're going to have data pipelines and things like that. So I don't know how, how they're going to be about all this as far as the algorithms and the software, but sure ain't going to be people involved. Uh, Michael, mapping our galaxy might be the next big use for it. Oh, that is one of the uses for it. <laughs> they are going to map things with this. Um, compiled with Gaia data, shocking results. That are, that's right. Uh, Gaia is also doing photometric stuff. Um, I'm sorry, photo um, astrometric stuff where they're measuring positions of things very accurately. <coughs> Okay, dude, this doesn't help. <laughs> I'm sorry. 1,024. A, a really super big thing equals 1,024. Slightly, really super big things, but a little bit smaller. <laughs> doesn't help. <laughs> I, I just don't get big numbers. Uh, no, Barry Rubin. Not, I thought it was in the same name for wise, but that explains why Tony had an image of a ground telescope. No, this is all on the ground. Yeah, this is not a this is not a space telescope at all. Um, all right, let me. I think I've gone through most. Do any of you guys on Discord want to say anything before I log away? Oh, here we go. Here's uh, hey, Uncle Bill, check this out. Stacy the linguist. Hello, hello. I I found y'all with the Knowledge Fellowship. Thank you for joining. Uh, glad to have more science peeps to hang out with. Welcome. It's good to have you here, Stacy, and thank you. Also, Uncle Bill handles the science, the the, the knowledge fellowship. Uh, in part, he's a member of the team that that handles this, and so I appreciate that work. And thank you for coming. Um, actually, it just occurred to me, you guys in the Discord can't see what I'm showing. Um, Cryptolicious, all oh, that's nothing. The new Pine Pro Pro <laughs> Pine Phone <laughs> Pro can handle that workload. <laughs> that's right, the Linux phone Pine Phone Pro. That's a mouthful. Uh, <laughs> okay. Um, so let's see, what do we got here? Um, I think, let's see. Oh, here's one more question, uh, from Charlie. I know the primary mirror can support, uh, I know the primary mirror support can correct the primary and the tertiary shape, but I'm unsure what they were using to detect the needed uh, to detect the needed corrections. Yeah. Um, so they just say that it's got an adaptive optic system, right? And they don't, uh, don't, you saw the diagrams I put up. I don't think it's very obvious in there what it is, but they do correct for it somehow. All right, guys, I think, um, Benjamin is saying, won't this be a huge central obstruction won't this huge central obstruction ruin the diffraction limit of the optics? Besides, you have four optically reflecting surfaces, which will all contribute to the grinding error. Uh, well, again, this is AO, so a lot of these errors will be corrected corrected from, but um, um, the huge central obstruction will affect the diffraction limit. But I think that we're talking about such a wide field of view here that I just don't, I think that this, you know, this is just not as big a deal as if it would have been a low or high magnification, uh, high focal length telescope. I could be wrong, but that's my response to you on that. Okay. Um, <laughs> never before seen a petabyte. That must be huge. I know. I've never seen one either. What does a petabyte look like? So... <laughs> I know. All right. So I guess, guys, I'm going to have to head out. Panther is really needing to go out. So I'm going to go ahead and stop this stream. Um, next week, I'll be back on Tuesday. And I stream every Tuesday and Thursday. I'll be back on Tuesday. On Thursday, I think I, uh, I will talk about the climate effects of space exploration from all the things that are going to be coming up from SpaceX and and uh and blue origin and, and all and nasa all the launches what what effect does it have uh from a carbon footprint point of view 
on the atmosphere. And so I'm going to talk about that on Thursday, on Tuesday. I don't know yet what I'm going to talk about. Um, I'll think about that right before I get started. <laughs> generally, if you have any ideas, things you want to see or discuss, put them in discord. The deep astronomy server is the link is in the description box. It should be coming up on, on stream elements. If you're on Twitch and Twitter, man, thank you guys for joining. Get over to the discord server. I should post that on Twitter. Uh, and interact with everybody and interact with us there. I hope you guys have a good weekend. Thank you guys so much for watching. Space Junk Podcast comes back next week. New Countdown to JWST comes out imminently, probably early next week. And Space Fan News will be starting back up as soon as I get some time. So thank you all so very much for watching. And as always, keep looking up.